Well, thank you for uh, the opportunity to be able to moderate your uh, fourth and final town hall meeting. Um, I'm excited to be here and it's always a joy to talk to you um, and also learn a lot from you. So I do appreciate a lot of um, your advice and mentorship um, since I've met you, what, a few years ago through our, um, through our Rotary Clubs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you were president at the, at, of the Rotary Club at the time I had met you. So I've seen a lot of what you've done in the community just as a service uh, person. And um, yeah, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So I am Nadia Damas. Um, I am a local business owner, um, have a small shop in town, uh, have about 30 employees or so. And um, the reason I'm here today is to ask questions about community topics and the focus on community issues. The major issue I'm finding, um, I also work with Faith in Action as their campaign chair, and um, we're working on the housing crisis that's happening in both the city and the county um, because our faith congregations believe that this has been raised as a major issue um, in the past, well, many years. <laughs> Uh, so that's one. And also, um, I'd like to ask you a few questions on our immigrant community um, as a representative of the Islamic Association of the Shenandoah Valley. And um, just also other issues that come up in our conversation. So um, yeah, if you want to just, can we go ahead and get started here then? Yeah, thank you for, right. for doing this and taking time out of your schedule to be with us and, and pose the questions and have a conversation. Okay. Um, and I wish this was done in person too, but it is what it is. So <laughs> yeah. at least I can be comfortable at home. So anyway, um, so we're talking about housing. Um, and as I said, we found it to be a major issue um, in the city as well as the county. Um, so as I'm sitting here, you know, enjoying the peace and quiet and stability of having a home, how do you see what's happening in the area as, a, as um, when it comes to the homeless issue and trying to find shelter and that sort of thing. Yeah, as an architect, I, I, I deal with designing solutions for um, housing all the time. Housing is a basic human right. So we all need and deserve to have shelter. So Harrisonburg is struggling with affordable housing options and workforce housing options. And it's a, it's a long-term problem that has gotten worse as the years have gone on and as cost of construction have gone up and demand has gone up for the houses that we have available. So it's, it, there's multiple elements of this and it's gonna take years to solve it, but we've got to start. We've got to, we've got to start somewhere or we'll never solve it. It's just gonna to continue to get worse. So for affordable housing, the zoning ordinance is a place to start and I'm, I'm now on a committee that's working on the rewrite of the zoning ordinance. And that will allow for different type of development than what we've done in the past. The, if you, you think about the origins of a, of a zoning ordinance, it was because of the agricultural um, population moving into the city for factory jobs. And they started those agricultural that agricultural population started building shelter, very dense and sanitation became a problem and the density became a problem and the zoning ordinance was a way to divide up a city into a more, a safer, cleaner way of living. Um, those are kind words because there's definitely some, some systemic racism that's embedded in that. It was a way to divide up but it was also a way to solve some problems that were happening in the world in cities. So our zoning ordinance hasn't been updated since the early nineties. So mm -hmm. it doesn't allow for the way that we could develop today that we might not have developed in the early nineties. So rewriting that zoning ordinance to encourage density. Um, as, as you know, Nadia, my dad lives with me. So having multi-generational housing options, isn't always allowed depending on what that means to you. So 
in my house, my dad eats dinner with us every night upstairs. He lives in a, 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 an apartment with a kitchenette downstairs. But if you needed to have a full kitchen downstairs for his way of life, it wouldn't work here because of the way our zoning is set up. So we can't have two dwelling units on a property. So looking at density options um, are important. Accessory dwelling units, ADUs, are something that other cities use to increase density in existing neighborhoods. And there are pros and cons to that. Um, we, we've seen the, kind of the challenges with a lot of Airbnbs in cities and how parking is dealt with. And certainly having another person living in the property probably adds a car. So an accessory dwelling unit in the backyard might add another car to the property. And if you don't have off-street parking, then on-street parking gets to be a battle. Um, so, I mean, there, there are pros and cons with each of these development things, and they're complicated, which is why it's going to take a long time to fix. The other piece that we've seen in the 12 years that I've been here is JMU has been incredibly successful and growing. And as they buy more properties for what they need to exist as a business in town, and they have more student population come in that live off of off grounds, then the available rentals start being rented as bedrooms instead of as houses for families, which impacts the available housing stock. So we lose affordable housing options for families. If we had accessory dwelling units in the backyard, that could be a student rental, which could help that family afford the house on the front of the lot. So there's some benefits to that added density. And then looking at mixed use and smaller lot sizes, all of those pieces. And then I know Faith in Action is working on a housing trust fund mm -hmm. to hold affordability in place over long term. So somebody might buy the house. You can explain it better than me, but I'll give it a shot. You can correct me. Somebody can buy the house that the housing trust has bought the land and that land stays at a consistent price. So any profit goes back into that land when they sell the house next. So it, it keeps that house below market rate forever, which makes it more affordable than the market rate house next door that consistently goes up. Is that a fair explanation of your housing trust? I know it wasn't as in-depth as what you can do. So um, so a lot of people use the, the terms of housing trust fund and community land trust interchangeably. Um, so if, I, if you don't mind me correcting you on oh, that. Oh, please, the, please. What you did explain was a community land trust, or a, yes, a um, community land trust, which places, um, it's worked for places like Richmond. Um, I can see it also happening within our community. Um, but to purchase that land and make a community land trust, that could be established through the funding provided by something like a housing trust fund. So essentially the housing trust fund um, is something that would be administered as a tool by the city. Um, money would come in from both the city as well as um, funding from other partners like a major university like JMU, um, places like Centera could also contribute. Um, and these funds would be handled by a committee that would figure out what the priorities are that they would like this funding to go towards. Um, so our state has a housing trust fund. Um, there are over 800 uh, trust funds already uh, nationwide that have been successful. Um, and we're hoping to bring that here to the Valley. Uh, and I hope to be working on you with that soon. Yeah, I, and I'm, I'm supportive of that. And you and I have had those discussions. The COVID has slowed down how we can do it. And I don't know how to solve that quite yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm looking at the news coming out of JMU of their budget shortfall for this year because of COVID. And I'm, JMU is a business. We need to make sure that they are functioning and we, they're not just a source of revenue for all of our problems in the city. I wish they were. Right. But they're, they're a partner that, Without them, our city doesn't exist. So, I, yeah, I agree. Developers, JMU, Centera, major employers are, we all need to come together as partners to solve the whole problem that we have here. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, and the thanks. housing trust fund wouldn't be a, 
um, the you know all solution that would solve right. all of the issues. Um, it would just be one of a tool that would be used. Um, and I, I feel like what the community is looking for is something that's long term. I think um, our service providers, our developers, um, people on council, we're all kind of tired of the band-aids and then the issue rises up again, the, you know, the following summer. Um, and it's just gotten to the point where it's like, look, we need to find someone who will take action. And I see, I do see that coming from you and I appreciate the conversations we've had on that. Yeah, it, these are long-term problems and they'll need long-term solutions. And some of the solutions are going to be painful. We're going to have to go through some growing pains to get to a resilient, sustainable city for long term. And I think we can get there. Um, I know we'll talk about this later, but the, the cultural diversity of Harrisonburg is what makes Harrisonburg so beautiful. And if we all work together as humans and we don't label each other, we can solve any of these problems. You've seen it through COVID, the way people have stepped up, the number of masks that have been made by people that had sewing machines in town because we had a shortage of masks shows how people will step up when given the opportunity to help others. But it's also highlighted our essential workers. And I mm -hmm. think coming back to help that population, um, what United Way is titled as the Alice population, the asset mm -hmm. limited income constrained and employed, uh, they make up 60% of our city, which is a very big number for the state yeah. within the state of Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, so for us to combat that, I mean, we need to help this population before they end up in, um, going to the homeless shelters, which are already packed. And with COVID, they've um, already, uh, they're not finding the relief they need. Um, I know that they're working on, uh, and you've talked about this with me before, is a permanent thermal shelter. Um, do you want to address some of that or your ideas on that? Yeah, we, we need a permanent thermal shelter in Harrisburg and mm -hmm. city council at their last meeting rezoned a building temporarily so there could be a temporary one. Um, I'm not sure what's going on that that hasn't been finalized yet, but we haven't, as you put it, another Band-Aid. Uh, this would only be a, a, a temporary thermal shelter and, and there's opportunities. I've been looking at what properties might be available that would be right for a long-term thermal shelter. And right now we have federal funding that can help with this. This is that's a, always, how are we gonna pay for it? There's federal funding that will help us get this thermal shelter permanent in place with the right services surrounding our houseless population to support them in the ways that they need right now. So it's, it's imperative that we do during COVID, but it's also imperative to do when we have the opportunity to do it financially. And, and I know a lot of people are struggling right now, but because of COVID, one of the good things that are coming out of is we have some money to address this issue that has been around in our community and we haven't had the funds to address it for years. So um, I'm hoping that that temporary shelter gets opened because the weather's getting cold. Um, it was, it'll be in the forties, maybe upper thirties in the morning when I go out for my morning walk. It's, it's feeling pretty cold already. Um, I'm very fortunate. I have a warm place to be tonight and not everybody has that right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it definitely is a blessing. And as you said, it's a basic uh, need that everyone should be allowed to have, uh, not just those who are employed or um, are able to work or, um, you know, our, especially our senior community. I mean, with the limited income, um, what can we do to help those populations as well? Um, so I think all of that needs to be laid out and um, I, I know you're looking at things like the budget and how to move things around so that we are helping um, the community the best way that we can just as a community as a whole. So yeah. um, another question I did want to raise was um, you were talking somewhat on the student housing and how Jane you could be a stakeholder and helping us with affordable housing. Um, but how do you see the students impacting the housing as well as how do we keep the students here um, in the area? Because a lot of this area has is JNU alum and they've brought in businesses. They've brought in profit. Um, they definitely bring in profit to our downtown area and, and activities and places like that. So um, how would you how would you attract uh, more residents to stay here? 
and not just JMU, but EMU as well. Um, not as large a footprint, but still the the cultural resource, the intellectual resource that we get from having two universities in our city is pretty amazing. The It's a financial, without JMU, if JMU wasn't here, Harrisonburg would not exist as it is because of the financial resources that having a major university in town. And we, we feel it when EMU is not in town as well, even though it's a smaller student body. So the financial resources that we get from those people being here for their time in school is critical for us to exist the way that we exist. Both of us are small business owners. That's an incredibly important incubator, even though you probably don't have students coming to your shop and I don't have students coming to my shop, but because they go to other shops, those shop owners can at least call me for design. Um, they still might not be calling you for your very precise um, um, instruments that you're creating. Um, but we need a vibrant economy um, in our community and those two universities definitely contribute to that. The, the worry that I have and, and what you see a lot of is when those students graduate, they leave. And I moved here because it's an incredible place to live. It's an incredible place to raise a family, to run a business. And we need to make sure that they know those opportunities exist. We need to continue to attract new opportunities that would interest them. But again, with all the bad that COVID has brought, it has also brought remote working. So I was just in a seminar this morning at the TomTom Tom Festival, which is a virtual festival out of Charlottesville. It's virtual this year out of Charlottesville because of COVID. And they were talking about a city that has created a place for remote work to happen easily. So they're starting to attract very high wage workers to live in their smaller town that are still working in their other city. So there's pros and cons to that. So having fiber throughout the city is gonna be incredibly important for that. Having flexible workspaces like Kirsten has done with, um, she changed the name, The Perch. This, having that, being able to rent a desk or having our coffee shops. I, anytime I walk by Black Sheep Coffee, I see people there working um, remotely. So whether they're students or business owners. So having, that kind of environment in town is incredibly important to keep the students here so that this isn't just a four-year stop, but it becomes a long-term home because it's a great place. They could start a business. Chado is an example of that. Most people know the name Chado. He was a student at JMU, graduated and started a business here, and he's raising his family here. We need more success stories like Chado that from these students creating innovative businesses or even just joining the workforce in town. Because at, at the end of the day, having the business based here is going to be better than having somebody remote work because that will generate more activity and more income, which will allow us to have more flexibility and we can solve more of the problems. But we wanna keep the students here. So if they need a high tech job working for somebody in California, they might as well live in the best place in the country here and work remotely for that company and make a higher wage than they would earn living here working for a company that's here. So I, I, th I think it's opportunity in expanding the, the options. Our economic development office is doing a great job of entrepreneurial incubators. So they have the launch program, which is starting again. I think they've already finished one um, version of that. So they're teaching people how to start up businesses and run businesses. Um, we have facilities in town and downtown where you can rent a, a desk for a day we have a fiber, a company that's installing fiber throughout the city now, which doesn't make it accessible for everybody. We need it to be accessible for everybody. So I, I, there's still a lot of work to be done on that front. Um, but at least we do now have fiber. I have fiber to my office from one company and fiber to my house from another company. So we have options in town, which is amazing and something we didn't have two or three years ago. So I, I, there's work to be done, but I think we can get students to stay here and live here long-term and, and not just look at this as the place they went to school and come back and visit for one weekend of football a year. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think something we, we both appreciate about um, the city and the Valley is its diversity and that includes the students and that includes, um, you know, our workforce and that includes all of these people. And, and as we said before, um, what, is their attraction is having that stable, affordable housing. Um, and when I say affordable, 
it could be um, you know a, a small property or it could be what someone considers affordable that's over 250,000 um, but we need to have that that flexibility and that diversity to be able to handle both as a community um, and I think that's obviously a, a reflection in our school system uh, when we see the, um, the diversity and the, the, the immigrant population just within our, our elementary school and our high schools. Um, and I would like to get into um, the, the, the diversity and, and speaking about the immigrant population. Um, my next question would be, how can we make sure that refugee and immigrants are included at all levels of, de of decision making in our, in our city? Yeah. It I've already touched on it that that's what I love about Harrisburg is how it's such a diverse population and I see that in our schools I see it in our businesses I see it in our food options available yes you know, I love to eat um, our restaurants you can find all kinds of delicious amazing foods here in Harrisonburg so it's here and it's what makes Harrisonburg such a special place and a lot of a lot of that diversity is because we have EMU here. So we need to celebrate that EMU brings that to our community. JMU, JMU does as well, but EMU is bringing uh, the uh, Peace Institute every summer, people from all around the world to be here to, to study how to live in peace, which is just an amazing program. Um, right. to, to stand with and walk with everybody in the community, you have to offer services and sometimes to reach equity, somebody needs a little more help than somebody else would. So me as a white guy, and when I had hair, it was blonde, I got a lot of passes in life because I looked like what I look like. And there's other people like you as a female business owner, I would imagine you've run into challenges that I would not run into simply because of our gender. And that's not right. So we need to empower through programs to make it possible for everybody to excel and be successful. So business training for entrepreneurs that I talked about already is a, a good way of doing that. If somebody is coming from another country and they own their own business, whatever it might be, maybe they were an architect. When they get here, they're no longer licensed to practice architecture, even though they have all the skills that I have. They didn't go through the process here to prove it. So they can no longer practice architecture. So offering training and offering support to get through the process so that they can get back to where they were before they got here or to give them training to get to where they want to be if they weren't there before. So having those trainings in place, and I think the city has some of that. It could have more of that. We need to continue that to make sure that everybody is being heard. Translation services is, is critical. We've seen it during COVID. The city has done an amazing job of translating all of the warnings and signs and, and policies for COVID. We need to do that with everything that we're doing in the city so everybody can participate in the city activities. And that's a, a pretty large undertaking to translate everything into 60 plus languages that are spoken at our high school. But right now, we've just started on the second, right? We just started on Spanish translation at city council meetings, thanks to Sal's leadership and that effort. We need to make sure everybody knows that that's available and we need to expand it. We need to continue to offer different languages to get more people to come to the table. And the other thing that I've seen this city council being very deliberate about, particularly Chris and Sal, Richard and, and Dina, is making sure our boards and commissions reflect our city. They look like our city, they sound like our city, they represent our city. So having more people that represent all the parts of our city on our boards and commissions will bring everybody to a better level together. We'll rise together. The thing I talked about in the, the business forum that the rising tide raises all ships. That goes for our community as a whole. If we work together and see each other as whole people and not labels, then we can rise together and we can be that resilient city that I know is possible. And that's what I'm working towards a resilient city that, has an outstanding business community, including the workers that are protected and respected, that we focus on sustainability and that we deal with these community issues that we're talking about tonight. 
Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I had some questions within that, but I think you've covered a lot of what I wanted to, to ask you about. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the, the diversity, I mean, that's what the friendly city is all about, right? So, um, um, there's, so there is a very deep appreciation for um, more than just, you know, there's so many, like we talked about languages, but when it comes to um, businesses and uh, business types that can be brought into the Valley um, from those who might have been licensed abroad and then come here looking for an opportunity. I think just uh, being open-minded to giving them that chance to do that um, is a very big deal for people. Um, at least within, you know, when I go to the Islamic Association of the Shenandoah Valley, um, they, they, they're just looking for someone to hear them and to, to um, learn that they do have an opportunity and they don't get lost here in the city. Um, so you just being a kind neighbor to them and, and hearing that, but also working um, with your position on city council and, and being open to hearing that side, I think is, um, can be very impactful um, for, for that community. Um, so in talking about the community and, and the relationships we have, I wanted to bring up, um, what, what is your vision for the relationship between Harrisonburg's police and the, and the Harrisonburg residents? And what changes would you like to see in Harrisonburg's in investment in criminal justice? Mm -hmm. um, because we see, of course, a lot of um, money that's not only going to our jail, but also Middle River. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so how, how would you work on that? And what do you see happening there? Yeah, so the first thing I'll say is I'm still learning about the criminal justice system and the built-in systemic issues that exist within it. And we're seeing that nationally. And it's overwhelming and difficult to comprehend and to digest. And the stuff that we heard at a recent debate is just um, depressing and overwhelming. And I, I condemn racism. I have work to do myself in that, that department. Um, to be anti-racist is new for me and it's, I'm, I'm working on understanding what that means and, and how to be, how to see people as whole people and not apply the labels. I'm speaking to myself when I'm talking about that. So when it comes to our local police force, Chief English was an amazing chief. Absolutely. And I'm so sorry he left. I'm happy that he is back closer to family and I think happy about being closer to the family. So that, that's good. But how fortunate are we to have Chief Camacho as our interim chief who has gone through a department that was defunded and rebuilt it. And he's on the same page with Chief English about building a community police force. And I think that's the, the biggest thing that I heard from Chief English was that our police force here needs to be of the community and part of the community and know the community because I, I believe, I, I'm not going to try to quote him because I'm not going to remember, but you're going to react differently if you're called, put on a call to somebody you know versus somebody that you've never met before. So if your police officers are walking the neighborhoods and getting to know the people in the neighborhood, when they're responding to a call in that neighborhood, their response is going to be different. Your response to them will be different because you know them. So I think that's the first step and it, it, it comes back to affordable housing. We need to make sure that our first responders can afford to live in our city that they're serving because you can't be part of the community if you're not part of the community. If you're just working here and then you go home every night out in the county or Luray or wherever you might live, then you're not part of this community. You're not living here. You're just working here. So making sure that we have the affordable housing piece and workforce housing available yeah. is an incredibly important piece of building this community police force. The other thing that I'm very interested in, and I'd started a conversation with Chief English before he left, is mental health response. So a police officer is, is trained to respond to an emergency, multiple types of emergencies, but they're carrying a gun and they're carrying cuffs. So if somebody, they're also called to suicide attempts. And if you show up to a suicide attempt with a gun, you're opening the door for other possibilities to happen that 
no police officer want to happen. So I, I think there's possibility that we can revision how mental health response happens and it's gonna take funding. We can't ask our current mental health professionals in our town that are already overtaxed with work and asked to do more than they possibly can get done to also be a, a police force. But Charlottesville just announced that they're creating a, a, cri a mental health crisis task force and I'm very interested in seeing how that works and how that's being funded and how we might be able to take good pieces of that and implement it into our town. And so I wanna to continue to have that conversation with Chief Camacho, which I haven't had yet, um, and figure out if there's solutions and the other piece that was in the news this week that's is, is awesome is Harrisonburg Police Department is now accredited, which I don't know exactly all the things that went into accreditation, but I know it holds them to a higher standard than they were held to before. And it will allow for the training that they need. And Chief Camacho is continuing the training that Chief English had started so that all the police officers have gone through mental health response training. So funding, training, and affordable housing are three ways that I say that are very important to start making sure that we don't end up with problems in the future. Yeah, um, and you and you hit on that, um, you know, having our workforce and our police force uh, and having the need for them to have good housing, uh, stable housing. But I think that's also important for uh, the children in this community. Um, that a child doesn't need the extra st stress of knowing where they're going to go home uh, when they get off, if they're going to get off the bus at the same residence they were at yesterday. And mm -hmm. um, children shouldn't need to know about evictions and, and that sort of thing. So um, I did want to touch on a little bit about the education. And um, it does make a, it is a large chunk of the current budget. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And how can we strengthen education? Um, not only for um, the smaller children, but also the children coming in, um, you know, from having a different culture and the, and the diversity that we're seeing um, from the immigrant population. Yeah, so you mentioned eviction. So let me say that I'm so thankful we have Mercy House working on preventing evictions. And uh, I know that's complicated to work through right. that process. But and, they are tired of the, and I don't want to speak for them, but I think a lot of our service providers are tired of these short-term band-aids when dealing yeah. with issues. Um, yeah, but thank goodness we have the band-aid right now during COVID. Yes. And yes. They, these are systemic issues that have been going on and we need mm -hmm. to address them holistically or we're not going to solve the problems. On the education front, the, the first thing I'll, I'll say is that we have a school board that get to make most of the decisions about how we use the, the money and then the city council gets to approve their budget. So that's just the, the process of how it steps down. The, I think the most important thing that we need to do for our education system is get our second high school built. Our current high school is oversized. We had a, a commission of residents in the city that evaluated all the options and this was the best option according to that panel, that group of people that studied this issue for over a year. Mm -hmm. And the longer we take to get it built, the more expensive it's going to be. So we need to get it back up and going as soon as possible. I don't know how soon that is with COVID. Everything is contingent on, can we get a vaccine? Can we move out of this time of not working fully, not having uh, operational budget fully, not knowing what tomorrow holds with all the um, surprises that COVID brings us. So we need to get that high school built as soon as possible. We need to make sure that our, our educational system here is, is funded fully to achieve the goals that we've set forth for them. Uh, that doesn't mean we need to build the best possible building that's going to make national news. We need to build very functional buildings that can be beautiful, but meet the teacher's needs of what they're saying that they need to be able to teach the children. And that's the most important piece for design. And that's, one of the reasons, a big reason that I wanna be on city council is I can start asking questions from a city council perspective, from an architect's perspective on city council about how we're constructing buildings in the future and make sure that we're making long-term decisions that are best for the city long-term. That's why I want to empower business to be highly successful is so that we can fund these projects that we know are coming 
in our future pipeline around education, but around other building projects that, that Harrisonburg wants and we've been working on. So education is incredibly important. I, I'm always overwhelmed, impressed when I talk to the teachers and hear all that they're doing. I don't know how in the world they are now teaching online, teaching in person, adapting within a day to change what they're teaching, mm -hmm. keeping attention of students on Zoom. It's hard to keep my attention on Zoom. I don't know how you keep young children's attention on Zoom. So right. teachers are superheroes and it's amazing. So I want to make sure that we're keeping the best teachers that we can in town by funding them and providing them with the adequate facilities to do their job. That's the least yeah. that city council can do. Yeah, they've definitely been the heroes over the past year um, and how they've been able to, to do everything that they're doing. Um, I know that they've also not only been trying to teach and, and do, you know, lesson plans and, and kind of retrain the children on how to sit at a, at a tablet um, to, to work and listen and that sort of thing, but they've also been distributing food and, um, you know, sending letters and, and small notes to show that they care uh, for, the, for their classrooms. Um, and it's just, it's really been amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about COVID and what we've had to kind of live through the past year, which has been a struggle. I know as a um, business owner, as, as yourself, um, how it's impacted not only the business and the economy, but also um, the employees and, and the fears that they have, the stresses that they have, not only in their health, um, but in their, their economic health and well-being. Um, how, how do you see yourself helping um, companies recover and just residents in general recover um, through this pandemic? Yeah. So when Dina and Laura and I were talking earlier this week, this is the, the point in the, the conversation where I, I took a, a pause and I said, I wanted to thank Richard Baugh for his service. He's been on city council now for at least 12 years that I've been here. I'm, I'm not sure how long he's served and given his time and just running for office. I see how much time this takes to serve your city. Um, and I so appreciate his knowledge and contributions to our city and I'm sorry that we're losing him from city council this year. His quote is wear your mask. mask. <laughs> so that's not, he says it a little more colorful at times, but I think that's the most important thing that we can all do is wear your mask. We're being attacked by a virus. If this had been a military attack, we would have all come together as a nation. We would have stood shoulder to shoulder and we would have fought back. Now we need to do it six foot apart, but we need to come together we need to fight this virus together. We need to wear a mask. We need to distance from each other. We need to not gather in groups. We need to do what's right to stop the spread of the virus so that we can get back to normal. With cold weather coming, we're going to have to adapt again. Things are going to change again as more people are inside in cold weather. And with the way air distribution systems work in buildings, there's a good chance that the virus is going to spread more in the cold weather, not because it's cold outside, but because people are inside and the way that air systems work, it's going to spread more as we move into the winter months. So we need to do everything we can to stop the spread now to reduce the number of people that are infected. So wearing the mask, social distancing, not gathering. This is for students to hear. This is for professionals to hear. This is for citizens to hear. This is your weddings, your family gatherings. This is every, this, there's no exception. This right. virus isn't just hitting one population. It's hitting everybody. It just happens to have a more devastating impact on somebody that has pre-existing health conditions. But we don't know what the long-term impacts of this virus are. We're still learning. So my contribution to this is I believe, that, I believe in science. I trust the scientists that are saying that you need to do these things to stop the spread. And that's what we need to do to get business back on track is we've got to stop the spread of the virus. Right. Well, I did write down a bunch of the questions that were brought up in the presidential debate, but, you know, I won't put you through that. <laughs> I can't kidding. yell loud enough to do that. Um, but no, I, I again, uh, I really appreciate your time. I always enjoy our conversations. Um, and I really, uh, I working with a lot of service groups and, and um, just doing some community service in the area and working alongside you, um, I, I just really strongly believe that you will have 
make a big difference by being, you know, at the table at, with city council. Um, so I do wish you the best of luck and I look forward to working with you next year. Thank you so much for taking your time and, and being with me in this conversation. And I wanna encourage everybody to go vote. So regardless of who you're voting for, I want everybody to go vote. I encourage you to go vote early in person. If you're in the city of Harrisburg, you can do it in the atrium building now, Monday through Friday from eight till five. And then the last two Saturdays in October, it'll be open as well. And then on November 3rd is your last chance to vote in person um, if you don't get it done before then. So please go vote. Um, people have fought and died for the right for this. So we should all, we should have record breaking voting this year with 45 days available to go vote. Hopefully it works in your schedule one of those 45 days or on November 3rd. So please vote. Thank you. Mm-hmm.